Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Lunch and Learn program here at the Charlotte Museum of History. Uh, we have so enjoyed welcoming you to our virtual museum from home over the course of this year here, and we are so excited about today's presentation. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a brief moment uh, to kind of explain some of the controls. Today, we have both our Zoom room and we do have this streaming live on Facebook. Uh, this is a conversation. It's a chance to learn about Charlotte's sign history here, and we want to hear from you. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, please put it in the Q&A if you're joining us on Zoom. Uh, that is the two speech bubbles that are at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on your controls. Just hover at the corners and that will pop up. If you have any comments, if you want to know a little bit more about different things, uh, feel free to use the chat function. We would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, if you are joining us on Facebook, please post your questions in the comments there and we will make sure that our speakers are aware of those questions. Uh, if you have any sort of technical difficulty, please feel free to ask us in the chat or in the comments on Facebook. We are very happy to help you try to sort that out, but please keep in mind we are not necessarily tech experts, so we will just do the best we possibly can. Uh, now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Charlotte Museum of History board member Paul Krizea, who is going to be the host of today's program. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Chris Long with us today, who's going to be talking about signs of Charlotte. Uh, Chris is an eighth generation Charlottean and has been uh, photographing unique and historical signage for over a decade here in Charlotte. Uh, Chris started the Charlotte Sign Project, uh, and he really started to showcase Charlotte's rich history through its signs, but the project has grown into really a comprehensive photography collection uh, of different neighborhoods and all the different signs that are, are throughout Charlotte. Uh, Chris is uh, an encyclopedia of uh, really the signs of, of Charlotte, and not only the signs themselves, but the meanings behind them and the, the stories that they tell. Uh, this is all things that, that Chris is, is really good at talking about. So, so feel free to ask him questions as we go along. Uh, Chris has published uh, his, his photography, not only in a book that we'll talk about later, but uh, also locally in the Charlotte Observer. I'm sure you've seen some of his photography as well as nationally in magazines like Parade. Uh, so Chris, let's talk about your work. Uh, let's talk about how you got all this started and uh, a little bit about the history of your project. I'm excited. Thanks so much, Paul. And thank you, Lauren and the Charlotte Museum of History for making this platform and conversation and opportunity available. Um, this is going to be an energetic conversation. It's going to be a colorful one. We have a lot of beautiful pictures and a lot of good history. So make sure to chime in with memories or questions or whatever. Um, I think I'll start with uh, starting with sharing my screen to get uh, get this party started. How does that sound? Let's make it happen. All right, how does that look? Can everybody see that intro image? Looks good. Great, okay, so yes, as Paul mentioned, and as hard as it is to believe, this project has been going on for a decade now. 2010 was when this started, and it really started as a high school darkroom photography thesis project. I was tasked with putting together a collection of images that were all of one theme and was something I was passionate about. And also, as Paul mentioned, I'm an eighth generation Charlottean. So I grew up with stories of Charlotte. I grew up with conversations and this history and being able to see um, the, the past Charlotte that was in our modern Charlotte after the banking boom that we've had so that's where the project really kicked off was at Myers Park High School. And it's uh, interesting, let's zoom out here, but um, this is uh, me with my Myers Park Mustang shirt on representing Myers Park, which is where I went to high school, right behind the Athens restaurant sign. Some of you may recall that it was down on um, now Charlottetown Avenue, which used to be Independence Boulevard that Forced through the Elizabeth neighborhood. And when it was lit up in its full glory, it was quite a sight. The chef's eyes were light bulbs. He had five light bulbs in his hand, and those were 
to signify coins. They would flash and they would beckon you to come into the 24 hour diner. So that's just a little bit of intro um, to get us started on where this project grew out of. And if you're familiar with the book, um, this uh, image may be familiar. This is right before the very first image that the book kicks off with. But it also is a good card to begin with of this story of the Charlotte Signs Project in 2010. The very first image that was a part of this collection that has continued to grow is the Jesus Save sign that was in the Wesley Heights neighborhood off of Tuckasegee Road, now called Wesley Heights Way. And this sign really doesn't just tell a story about the church congregation that put it on top of their building, but it also tells about the story of Charlotte's architectural history. Prior to the Great Depression, there was a building in downtown Charlotte, the Charlotte Auditorium. And it was a grand structure. And this church, the Gar Memorial Church, wanted to purchase the building and move their fledging congregation into it. Um, but the city's price on that building was too high. They could not afford to buy the building. So they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And years later, when the Great Depression occurred, the city of Charlotte demolished the Charlotte Auditorium and the Gar Church approached the city once again. And they said, hey, we would love to buy your architectural plans for that building. We would love to buy the rubble. And at that point, it was a fraction of the price. And they bought that rubble and they bought those plans and they transported it all to the Tuckasegee Corridor where they reconstructed this building at a fraction of the cost. And they were a very um, innovative congregation. They had a lot going on. We could talk a whole series just on them, but they had this sign that was bright red neon that they put on top of their building to face the air corridors of the Charlotte, well, it was then the Charlotte Municipal or Douglas Municipal Airport, which is now Charlotte Douglas International. And this was a way for them to witness to the throngs of people coming to and from Charlotte. But this image could not have been more different than the second picture of this collection. So we first start off with Jesus Saves, and then the second image was the Amity Gardens Shopping Center. Now both of these signs came down, were demolished, within a week of each other in 2010. So that's really what got this project started, was it was already a race against time. And as mentioned, Jesus Saves was such a simple sign. Really nothing out of the ordinary. Neon was very, very, um, it was very much of a medium at the time. But then you have that compared and juxtaposed with this Amity Garden shopping center sign bright colors, beckoned people off of Independence Boulevard to come in, spend your money, Christmas shopping, birthday shopping, grocery shopping, whatever it may have been, you know, 1950s, 1960s consumerism. So you have these two signs that really set the stage for this project. So you may have seen this week on some news stories. Thank you if you are joining us now from seeing those news stories. But I spoke with WBTV earlier this week in front of the Ratcliffe's flower sign. This is a sign that is on down that is on South Tryon Street in downtown Charlotte. And you may recognize it, you may not, but it is significant. It is Charlotte's oldest neon sign. 1929 is when this sign was built and created, and it was restored a number of years later, um, around 2000. So, or two, year 2000, not 2000 years ago. Um, but this is just a great example of the architecture and the business that was booming at the time. You have Art Deco elements in the sign. You can see the kind of empire keystones at the top. You can see the script. You can see the wraparound of the neon on the sides. And also it shows how Charlotte was certainly a business center 
at the time or a shopping center because you had all your shopping districts in downtown Charlotte. That's where you went for your Christmas shopping. You had Ivy's department store up the street that would decorate um, for Christmas and Ratcliffe's Flowers was certainly one of those businesses. Now at night, you can see how this sign glows. And it is a sign that really shines. It really, really shows its gorgeous colors, red, green, blue. And some people may say, well, how does neon get its different colors? And that is a great question. And really, you have the neon gas element that is um, in its natural state red. It shows red color. But if you add different elements, you get different colors. If you add helium, you get yellow. If you add carbon dioxide, you get white. If you add mercury, you get blue. And so that's where these colors on this iconic sign really come to come from. This sign also is a great example of Charlotte preservation because you had Mr. Lewis Ratcliffe in the late 1960s, early 1970s, who told the city of Charlotte, you are not taking my sign down because that was when the strict sign ordinances for all of Charlotte, especially Center City, really took effect. And he kept his sign up, much to everyone's chagrin. But today, this sign is lauded as a great preservation feat and really is a piece of cultural heritage, cultural art in Center City. Now, I remember Chris. Yes, yes. I, think, I remember Chris when uh, Carpe Diem was uptown. Uh, and that sign was still in front of the original building, still attached to it. Uh, that that was well, just when I moved to Charlotte. That was a sign that really stuck out uh, and was uh, really iconic to me as well. You know, and it is, and I think it's it's a marker for um, different people in different ways, Paul. That's one of the things I've really seen about this project is signs have different meaning to different people because you may not have purchased flowers from Ratcliffe's Floral Shop, but you ate at the restaurant in the beautiful um, Mediterranean Revival style building that, burn, that the restaurant um, and the sign hang, hung off of. So signs represent so many different things to different people. I'm glad, yeah, glad you mentioned that. And everybody out there might have similar memories of, of different signs in different ways. Hey, Chris, while, while I've got you, yeah. uh, people have been listing some of their favorite signs. Uh, cool. Let me uh, see if any of these uh, have a story too, because I, I know you have some of the signs that they're mentioning are actually in your presentation coming forward. But uh, one that uh, was interesting is the Eastland Mall uh, iconic sun. Do you know what's the story with that at this point? You know, that's a great question. That's one of the newer signs on the, you know, skyline of Charlotte, but it's so iconic. And if you're not familiar with it, Eastland Mall was a um, very much of a beacon of a shopping center that rivaled South Park in its early days. That was off of Central Avenue on the east side of Charlotte. And the logo was a gigantic round sun, had rosy cheeks, had big you know, flames around it, really a happy sun. And when the mall was demolished, the signs were actually saved. So they are um, saved by an organization called Charlotte East, who is in charge of their future. So they're in safe storage right now. Hopefully they will be on display at some point uh, in our future. Great. So yes. Now one thing too that uh, you may notice if you have the book, and it's worth mentioning if, if you haven't seen it, is on each page I've published um, some details about the sign. So for example, Ratcliffe's Flowers, it gives the location, if the sign is still on display, if it's in storage, if it's lost to progress, and then maybe a little bit of history on it. So that's uh, something that um, I wanted to share with everybody there. Now, another similar sign to Ratcliffe's Flowers, but one that came much later is the Copal Grill sign. 
Some of you may recognize this from its location, former location on Wilkinson Boulevard, but this sign is unique because not only the colors that it would have lit up with at night, oranges and blues and really beautiful hues of neon, but the significance of the sign itself, it is widely regarded as Charlotte's first freestanding neon sign. So what does that mean? Because I thought Ratcliffe's was Charlotte's oldest neon sign. And what that's about is if you've seen pictures of downtown, whether it's our city or other cities around the United States back in the 20s and 30s, hundreds of signs are hanging on poles off of the structures lining the street. Freestanding means we have a sign at the road on a major highway standing by itself on a pole. So that's the significance of this one. This one is also in storage. It was saved. The restaurant is no longer with us, um, demolished back in, I think, 2008 or so. But uh, a beautiful one. Paul, do you remember that sign at all? I, I don't actually remember that one other than from your book. Sure, yeah. Well, there's a couple others that people out there might recognize, one of them being the open kitchen on West Moorhead Street. They are still going to town. They're still kicking and with it. And they served Charlotte our first pizza pie back in the 1950s. You can actually see at the bottom of the image under the sign on the building, it says the home of pizza pie. You didn't have Domino's. You didn't have Pizza Hut. You had open kitchen. And this was a beacon of a restaurant. I've heard stories from people that drove hours to Charlotte to go to the world famous open kitchen. And it's been in a number of, um, you know, not music videos, but popular culture um, ads or different advertising campaigns. Just the imagery of the sign is beautiful. And the building is pretty cool as well. You can see the tons of painted signage, the backlit signage. Um, the night shot that I have appearing in the book is certainly an example of that. And the pizza, you can tell, is actually neon. The outside of that crust is a neon um, band, which, which, of course, is glass tube filled with electrified gas. So certainly one of my favorite signs. Now, also a lot of people will recognize the Park Road Shopping Center. This is another sign that actually was recently restored, so it is still telling its story. And this shopping center, whether you've shopped there or not, is very much unique in Charlotte's story, as well as our architectural story and consumerism boom of the 50s and 60s. Park Road Shopping Center is Charlotte's first open air or first shopping center. You know, this predates South Park. This predated Eastland Mall. And really the closest thing you could get to the shopping center would have been, like I said, the downtown shopping district. Um, but of course, this was out in the suburbs. This was out in the country at that point. And um, Park Road Shopping Center is an iconic example of mid-century modern flair, mid-century modern architecture. While we're talking about shopping centers, one shopping center sign that people have brought up is the Coliseum Shopping Center from Independence Boulevard. Do you know what the story is with that one? Oh, I'm so thrilled that you asked that question or that whoever did asked it. Yes, the Coliseum Center sign, uh, shopping center sign is saved. You know, it's a shopping center that was up on Independence Boulevard. Um, you would recognize that it's where the Echo Automotive uh, Center is now. It's recently been redeveloped. And I have some pictures for everybody that you will not get anywhere else. You'll get them right here. They're the Coliseum Shopping Center. And um, I'll tease you with that because it's, it's coming up later. So here's, here's an image of the Park Terrace. This is also at Park Road Shopping Center. Now it's a great example of sort of mid-century modern design, but another kind of arm of that movement, which was called the Googie movement, G-O-O-G-I-E. Almost like Google, just without the L with an I. And it was defined by some organic shapes, but also some very much geometric shapes. You can see that here. And in Eden Shopping uh, Center, who has 
purchase Park Road Shopping Center, they uh, recently restored this as well. Now, another sign that some of you, I think, have mentioned and have seen is the JFG coffee sign. This is a sign that was located on 277, just right outside of Center City, Charlotte, on that beltway. And it was Charlotte's longest advertising campaign. Now, it's no longer up. It came down in 2000, and I think nine or 10, was restored by the coffee company, which is based out of Tennessee, and was put back up on the music factory, which is where I took this image. You can see the Hearst Tower and the Bank of America Tower in the background to give you a placement, some geography there. But these letters were 10 feet tall. The J was 10 feet tall. The F was 10 feet tall. The G was 10 feet tall. This thing was huge and lit up. It was a um, lighthouse almost, but people knew when they got to Charlotte, when they got home, this was the sign that marked their arrival. And I've seen people cry over this sign. I have seen people laugh and tell so many memories over this sign. Um, certainly a beautiful one. And actually, um, it is in a Charlottesville's private collection. And hopefully, there's plans to put it back up. Who knows? We'll see. But um, it's been uh, certainly an icon that a lot of Charlotteans remember. Now, I mentioned earlier about the kind of arteries, the roads of Charlotte. You know, this was before I-77. This was before 85. Charlotte was um, actually the country, you know, pre-interstate system had just main highways like Wilkinson Boulevard that turned into Independence Boulevard. That was the artery of a road that came through Charlotte. Similar but not as highly traveled roads were South Boulevard and some of the other boulevards um, around Charlotte and in Charlotte. And if you drive down Wilkinson today, you see uh, visions of the past. Here's the Oak Den Motel that is still standing, still going strong. A lot of these places that I talk about and have photographed, I recommend um, people to go to. You know, hey, go to this restaurant, go here. Don't know that I recommend you go to the Oak Den Motel, but um, it's certainly worth taking a picture of the sign and then motoring on. Um, so that's, that's a gorgeous one. S closely to it, down the street, you have Barbecue King, one of the favorite drive-ins of Charlotte. You have Barbecue King anchoring the west side of Charlotte on Wilkinson Boulevard. And then you have South 21 anchoring the, I guess, almost east side of Charlotte on Independence Boulevard, both Highway 74. Lights up at night beautiful blinking, very peaceful, very rhythmic, um, but uh, it's worth seeing if you haven't. And just almost next door to it is the Dairy Queen, which is the only surviving Dairy Queen in the country, in the United States of America, that uses the original branding campaign that uh, started out with Dairy Queen franchises, and that is the Inuit holding and ice cream cone. It was recently restored, recently repainted, so it has fresh colors. Um, people drive from all over to see this location. People come from out of town who are sign enthusiasts and history enthusiasts just to see the Dairy Queen. So this has far-reaching impact beyond our Charlotte, North Carolina uh, city center. And to that point, with the Copal Grill that I mentioned earlier, that sign, as well as many of these on Wilkinson Boulevard, were featured in a couple Hootie and the Blowfish music videos. So if you want to do a little bit of uh, jamming and watching, go look up one of their music videos and you will see some of these signs lit up in their glory. And the book has a map that shows these locations as well. That's where you can really see these uh, pockets of a time, you know, a, a, a time machine, basically. You have Plaza Midwood, which has a number, probably the most of any neighborhood, that are these old, iconic, awesome-looking, well-designed, historic signs. Again, you have Wilkinson Boulevard. You have South Boulevard that goes on down to Pineville. And then some in the city center that are still there, which is pretty cool. Now, Paul, do you have anything you want to jump in with right now? 
Yeah, let me ask you uh, some signs that came up that, that we didn't discuss, and I don't want to take up too much time talking about them, but if you sure. kind of know their status uh, or, or just want to discuss them at all, that there was the Lance uh, sign, uh -huh. uh, the Cavalier skating, uh, yeah. and this one I'm not familiar with, Marding's Hardware. Oh, yes. Okay, so let's start with the first one, Lance. You know, that factory used to be a brick building um, right on South Boulevard, I think it is. And, of course, those are apartments and office suites now, and they're located farther down South Boulevard. They actually still have a water tower with um, one of their logos on it, which is pretty cool. I always enjoy seeing that one. Now, you mentioned the Cavalera Skating Rink, and that is a very timely sign to mention because the Cavaleras family is tied in with the sign that is on your screen right now, which um, we will talk about. But probably the Cavaleras sign that was mentioned is of a skating boy, you know, on roller skates that would have been animated neon. So that's one of the other cool things about these neon signs is many of these signs back in the day, if they had imagery on them, would have been animated. They would have had lights going on and off to imply movement, which would have been the case with the Cavalaris boy, as he's been called. He would have been skating along, you know, his legs flying up and down as he motored around the skating rink. Of course, this was a freestanding sign out near um, Moorhead Street, which is where the building still is. That's where the Dilworth Grill is now. And then, what was the last one you mentioned, Paul? The last sign? Oh, Martin's Hardware. Martin's Hardware. Martin's Hardware is um, actually reflective of a hardware store that is right off of Park Road after it has turned. So not near Park Road Shopping Center, but closer to the Dilworth neighborhood. If you go to Ed's Tavern, which is where the old hardware store used to be, I mean, it's the same building, the neon sign has actually been moved inside. So if you are at the counter, if you're dining at tables, you can look up and have that bright red Martin's Hardware sign right above you. That's another good example of preservation. You know, it's a sign that's not needed for advertising, but it's a sign that still tells the story and adds a little bit of heritage to Ed's Tavern. So, yeah. So, so one more sign that I want to discuss, and this kind of leads into to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which was sign preservation. I mean, over yes. the years, we've lost a lot of signs, mm -hmm. uh, but we've also had some great efforts to try and save signs as well. Uh, and I want you to talk about that, but, but one question we just got, which kind of ties directly into this, and I think is a good one for you. What sign is missing or unknown where it is that you would most love to see turn up? You know, that's something that's always on my mind. And there's four signs. I won't tell all four right now because I know you asked for the tip top. So I have four signs that are iconic signs that have gone missing either through theft or have disappeared or are just, I know they're out there, but who knows where. But the tip top sign that I would love to see appear, if it's not the Cavalier skating rink sign, which is still out there somewhere, it's the coffee cup sign. The coffee cup was an eatery, hole-in-the-wall eatery on Clarkson Street, Clarkson Avenue, right off of Moorhead Street across from the Panthers Stadium. Now that business, uh, well, it went out of business and was demolished back, I think, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. And the sign, that is the biggest mystery to all of Charlotte because it was stolen off of the building just within the week or two, but nights before the building was demolished. So it's, the sign is in the, the shape of a coffee cup with a handle. It had steam that was painted on that would rise off of that and it's still out there somewhere. Who knows where it is? There have been different reports that different tips that I've gotten over the years, I've investigated every one. They've all been dead ends. So I hope that sign is, you know, in the garage or will be back up sometime soon. It's a beautiful sign. What year was that 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 happened? Yeah, that would, I'm pretty sure 2007, 2008. Yeah. 
And um, the business actually started in 1946. It was a historic eatery um, here in Charlotte that was actually an early example of voluntary integration um, in our city's history that was a gym or a, a sterling example of what you know, an integrated example of a restaurant could be. So a culturally significant sign, as well as just a cool looking sign too. Yeah, Chris, who do we know that's obsessed with signs that might steal such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, are you implying? My goodness. <laughs> Every sign that I get is perfectly legal. <laughs> Hope, hope uh, you find it at one point and I will let you all know for sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned preservation, Paul, and I want everyone to look at this image that is from downtown Charlotte in 1956. It's from South Tryon Street and the gentleman at the center is uh, Grady Cole from WBT, the iconic radio host announcer and then um, to our right of him is Harry Golden the uh, publisher of a Carolina Israelite but this was the St. Patrick's Day Parade of 1956 look at the marquee of the theater behind them it's for the Tryon Theater and if you say well Christopher that's familiar I've seen that before well look at this next sign do you see the resemblance this is the same theater marquee it's the same sign, I'll bite a few changes, and it is located at the Dilworth Neighborhood Grill, right off of Moorhead Street, where we mentioned the Cavalera Skating Rink was earlier. So Cavalera Skating Rink is no longer there, but the Dilworth Grill is, as well as a number of other businesses. The Cavalera's family saw that this building downtown was going to be demolished. And in a nutshell, I'm paraphrasing here, Mr. Cavallaris asked the, um, I guess, property owner or the contractor, hey, can I have that marquee? I want to save it. They said yes, brought a trailer, loaded it up, brought it to their building and restored it, put it back up. Um, and it's been there for years now. But what a good example, along with the Reckless Flora sign of repurposed use, but also historic preservation that is beautiful. I can't imagine anyone seeing this marquee and not, you know, having some emotion of, wow, this is awesome. Wow, look at those colors. Whoa, I wonder where that came from. I mean, this is an iconic place. Paul, just like you, you may not have known it when it was the Tryon Theater. You might know it when it's Neighborhood Grill, but people have connections to these signs. People have connections to all of these signs in some way. And there's another sign that comes to mind um, when talking about preservation. And that kind of goes into the phase of the project that I've been working on since the book was published. I'm still photographing signs, but I've also taken a little bit more of an interest in the preservation of these signs. The Dilworth Food Market sign um, is probably memorable to many Charlatans, especially modern day Charlatans, um, not from the business that was there, but from the food truck Friday that was there. This was down in Dilworth on the corner of um, Park and Camden, Park Avenue and Camden Road. There is, I think, a 10 or 12 story office tower on this site now. But when this sign, when this property was being developed and the sign was coming down, I worked it out with the uh, property owner as well as the contractor to save the sign. Hey, is something happening to the sign? Are you going to preserve it? No, we're not. Do you want it? And so here's the truck loaded up with that big sign. Now that sign looks a lot smaller on the pole than it does in the truck. That was a heavy sign. That was a big sign. It took up the whole bed. But um, here I am after we got it home, had to unload it on the swing set, drive the truck underneath and take it off because it was so heavy, but that is safely in storage and um, working on the restoration of that. Similarly, we mentioned earlier the Coliseum Shopping Center sign. Now this shopping center was pretty much right next door to the Amity Garden Shopping Center on Independence Boulevard as you're headed out of town, making that big turn 
um, after you've passed some of those um, office buildings and some of the businesses that are no longer in operation there. It's on your right side. You'll know where the Walmart is. That's where Amity Gardens was. Coliseum Center is where the Echo Park Automotive Center and I think a car wash and gas station is now. It's right next to the Capri Theater, which is a Hertz car rental lot right now, if you recognize that landmark. But this was another sign that to so many Charlatans is so very memorable. And a, a couple years ago, when that property was being developed, um, I submitted a proposal to the developer to um, deinstall the sign after I uh, heard that there was going to be no preservation efforts with it. And so I um, worked with a sign company to fully deinstall that sign. It is also in storage right now. And that was a heavy sign. Those boxes were, you know, they look small, they look lightweight. Each one of those, not the center part of it, but the others were about eh, 75, 100 pounds. They're heavy. And then on top of that, you have the 15 foot tall metal poles underneath it that weighed more. They were 125 pounds. So each letter was a 200 pound behemoth of a sign. And that's what you get with these signs is they're metal, they're electrical, they're glass. They have um, a lot of weight going for them. So we took down every letter, we deinstalled every letter, and... Um, Wasn't there another sign of Coliseum on top of the building as well? There was, yes, there exactly was. And that one actually came down um, a number of years but prior to, and I'm not sure what year that would have been, but it was that would have been a neon sign. And those letters, that font was really cool. It spelled out Coliseum Center. It was on a scaffold-like structure on top of the shopping center, and it lit up bright red. It, it was a gorgeous one as well. In 2016, I toured the Museum of Neon Art in Glendale, California. Mona is its name. There I am, look at that big smile. You know, I'm about to head into a sign museum with a smile like that. And the thing you notice about these signs when you go into this museum is not the light, it's not the shapes, it's not the visual, but it's the sound. You hear these signs clicking and clacking. You hear the electrical hum. You hear these signs vibrations before you even really notice their design. It's a, it's a beautiful museum. Um, if you're ever in California, I encourage you to go to it. Um, but that's, yeah, so that's the preservation inspiration for where this project is headed. So, so Chris, if, if somebody sees a sign, well, let me start with this question. What to you is sort of the common denominator that makes signs iconic and, and worth saving? That's an awesome question. And it's a question that I start out answering in the book because, you know, what does make a sign iconic? Is it the way it looks? Is it history? And there were two criteria that I spelled out for this project from the very get-go before I took even one photograph. And that was that I had to be able to take the photo. These are not historical photographs from you know, archives or anything. It had to be a modern day survey of our signage history. But the second criteria answers that question, what makes a sign iconic? And in that, there were two um, criteria as well. First off, it had to be um, visually, you know, compelling or iconic. It had to have neon attributes. It had to have a really cool design. It didn't have to be old. So, for example, the JJ's Red Hot's hot dog sign um, on East Boulevard, that is not an old sign. That is not an old business. But you better believe that it's the coolest neon sign design that's probably come out of sign companies in the last 10 years. It has really awesome graphics. It utilizes neon. So that makes a sign iconic, is if its design is just above and beyond and unique. The second thing that makes the sign iconic is the history behind it. So Green's Lunch, for example, Green's Lunch Counter downtown, they're the oldest restaurant still operating in Charlotte, 1926. 
is when they opened and their sign is cool, don't get me wrong, but it's not really an iconic sign, but the history and the, the business is iconic. So that sign made its way into um, the project as well because of that, because it may not be neon, but it's the oldest sign in Charlotte or the oldest business in Charlotte. So if, uh, uh, if, if, some, if we see a sign that we think is our, our, our iconic and it's in danger of being taken down, mm -hmm. uh, what is something that, that a person could do? Like, is there a, a place to call or some actions that could be taken to try and help save uh, things if we, if we see it? Yeah, that's a great question because for preservation efforts like these, whether it's a sign or a building or a historic property, it, it's not one person that needs to be doing the job, it's the community. So there needs to be eyes on the ground watching all these things that are happening if you care about preservation, and that includes signs. I would um, encourage people to actually feel free to reach out to me via all of my social media channels. Um, museums are a great place to reach out to as well. Um, with the Charlotte Signs Project, one of the beautiful things that I've been able to do over the last number of years is really build relationships with um, people in the community, whether it's sign companies or um, groups such as the Charlotte Museum of History who's willing to assist with sign preservation efforts. And so I, I feel that, like the Charlotte Signs Project is poised very much so to go after a sign if it's in imminent danger. So Instagram, Facebook, cltsignsproject.com. Um, I'm, I'm very accessible. I'm on those uh, feeds all the time. So that's, that's one good option. Really just raising awareness. Even if you post a picture on Facebook, that's better than doing nothing. And, and so what does it take to, to restore a sign? Like how expensive is it? Is, are there companies that specialize in doing that? I mean, how does that get done? It's a process and it's both a monetary process as well as an expertise process. I can probably count on one hand how many people in the city of Charlotte do neon in 2020. It's not the medium that's so widespread as it used to be. It used to be every sign company dabbled in neon. Well, now you have really just a couple people who do in Charlotte. So it's a monetary expense, but you also have to weigh the um, idea of are we putting the sign back out to advertise to people to be used as a sign or is this a piece of art at this point because if you put it back out um, to advertise to people to roadside you know there's a whole new level of sign uh, guidances and um, you know criteria that that sign has to meet regardless of whether it's a historic sign or not so it's the expertise it's the monetary portion of it and I would also stipulate having it done accurately and correctly. There's a number of signs that have been restored with faux neon in recent years. And they look beautiful, don't get me wrong, but there's just something about the glass tube and that electrified gas that is um, certainly unmatched. One type of sign that you did not discuss, and, and maybe it's not within your project, but I'm just curious what you know about it, is the signs that uh, are painted on the side of buildings and then sort of fade over the years. And, and in some cities, you see a lot of those that uh, are, are still preserved. And sometimes they, uh, when a building gets removed, the side of the old build, the building next to it, and suddenly there's these old signs. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you know about those within Charlotte? There are... Are... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are, a, there's a number of them. Don't get me wrong. There's a number of them. They're called ghost signs. So for people who, you know, follow these and look up, um, you know, oh, what is that sign? Ghost signs. I'll tell you of a couple and I didn't photograph them yet, but I think that's coming. There's one over at Park Road Shopping Center in the back lot that you can see up on the brickwork for the old Ivy's department store that used to have a location there. I-V-E-Y apostrophe S. Very simple, but it's up there and it's fading away. There's another one over in Noda or North Charlotte um, off of 36 or North Davidson Street, I should say. 
and it's a Coca-Cola sign. It says delicious and refreshing, you know, five cent kind of thing, Coca-Cola. And it's a ghost sign as well. You've most likely seen it if you've seen some of the iconic autumn leaf pictures that of, of maple trees over in that neighborhood because they're right up against that building. So ghost signs are out there. Now Charlotte doesn't have as many of those because remember that's an old advertisement that's painted on a building and we have you know a building boom. So a lot of these buildings that were with us 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, if you really want to get crazy, are really not with us um, anymore. In fact, when the, um, the Bobcats slash Hornets Arena Spectrum Center was torn or was being built, there were buildings that were torn down that had beautiful ghost signs on them. Preservationists wanted them preserved, didn't work out, so we have pictures. Right. So uh, in your book, uh, the sign of the times, uh, you have, I don't know, well over a hundred pictures of, of different signs. Out of all of those, which is sort of your favorite, right? The one that hits you most. Yeah, there's definitely one that hits me the most and it's the South 21 sign. South 21 curb service, drive-in restaurant, East Independence Boulevard. They have, the company has served Charlotte since 1955. This location has served Charlotte since 1959. And it's a neon sign. It's red and it's white. It blinks. It is authentic to, you know, the curb hop drive-in era. And um, the family is a great family that runs it. Um, they do an awesome job. Their fried trout dinners on Friday nights are unmatched. That's my favorite sign. That's a beautiful sign. I, I know that one well. Well, listen, uh, I think we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, do you want to take a quick look at the Q&A, uh, if you can? Yeah, sure thing. And, and see if uh, there's some questions there that, that sort of really strike a chord, because I know we can't answer all of them. Let's see. Q&A, Q&A. Here we are. Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Okay, what is absolute favorite Charlotte sign? Boom, past or present? Okay, so present, South 21, past, I would actually um, say the Cavalier skating rink sign is one of them. So again, I mentioned the skating boy. It's out there somewhere. It's a really cool design. And um, it's, uh, you know, I hope to track it down one day, but Cavalier skating rink would be my favorite from the past. Let's see, speak to the important role our signs play as historical landmarks in a city that is constantly rebuilding ourselves? Stacy, that's an awesome question. Yes, that ties us to our past. And it's important to know where we came from. And I feel like that is a cliche that people hear all the time say, oh yeah, tie to your past, blah, blah, blah. But reality is, who are we today without our past? And to see where Charlotte has been over the last century. You know, we've gone from an industrial boom to a, a, a banking boom, you know. So as our city has changed, it's not just about the historic buildings, it's not just about these historic signs, but it's also about the people's stories behind these signs, the people that built up this city, the people that made it what it is today, the people's personal stories, as I mentioned, um, whether it's Paul remembering eating at the restaurant that had the Ratcliffe's flower sign or someone tearing up at the idea of the JFG sign. These signs tie us like a time machine to our personal past. And then are there other sign preservation efforts going on in the Carolinas? Thank you, Tom. So there are, and um, they're, they're Kind of few and far between. It's more on a local scale versus a larger scale of things. I see um, a number of sign companies throughout the state that, um, especially neon sign companies, who have an appreciation already for this art form, because at, at its core, neon is an art form. There's a company in Raleigh that um, they do modern signs, but they also restore historic signs. Locally, there's a company, uh, Neon Works, um, and Neon Deb is the, the uh, lady who runs that, and she's an incredible, talented artist as well, and she was the one that actually restored the Ratcliffe's Flowers sign. So 
there's a number of these efforts across the board. I would say mostly it's photography, but um, there are efforts locally and around the state. Okay, so, uh, and, and what are your thoughts on the newer signs that are, are coming on uh, online? And, and one example is, uh, I think Truist is putting uh, their sign up. Um, what do you think of the more modern designs, uh, not only of Truist, but, but of just signs in general? And uh, what trends do you see for that? That's right. So there's a number of signs that have been installed in the last you know, quarter, in the last three months that are incredible. There's one, um, the pr protagonist uh, beer. You know, it's, a, it's either neon or faux neon, but it's beautiful. I mean, it lights up, it's iconic. There's a number of others. I think at uh, Camp North End, there's a couple new signs that have gone up that are new designs, but they're iconic. And I think what you get is when you have freedom to design these signs and you're not tied down to a logo, that's where you get these iconic designs. Again, I mentioned JJ's Red Hots that was installed 10 years ago. So it's still fairly new, but even for um, 2010 when it was put in, that was a groundbreaking sign. It was an iconic sign that was, you know, they took their time in designing it. You mentioned the truest sign, and that is a sign that has caused a lot of conversation with sign um, enthusiasts as well as just charlatans over the last week or so. And with that sign, I would say that since it's mainly is the truest logo, you know, it's mainly the truest logo, there was not a lot of, um, you know, creative design um, ability that they had to take with it because you have brand standards for companies, especially like a banking center like Truist. So, you know, I have my personal thinking on that sign, but with that sign, it's, it's, a, it's a brand standard. So I think when you have more freedom to do a design with a really cool font or really cool lights or really cool colors, um, there's definitely opportunities there that people still are taking, that businesses still are taking. And I think people realize the fact that, hey, the more unique your sign is, the more conversation it causes, you know, that really impacts your bottom line down the road. It helps you out. Okay. So uh, one last question is, uh, one, one of the things that's interesting about the neon signs is how they have all the different colors. Mm -hmm. How do they get all those colors into the sign? Like, is it the gas? Is it the light? The, the glass that's covering it? Or how does that work? It's a, it is a process. It is a process, yes. So in a nutshell, you have a glass tube, whether it's clear glass or coated glass that will have color to it eventually. But it's a glass tube that is sealed with an electrical nodule at each end, you know, so it's vacuum sealed, and in that tube is neon gas. So in these old neon signs, you have gas that's been in there for, you know, 50 years, 75 years, however long it might be. So it's old gas, but it still is neon gas. And to get the different colors, when you electrify that gas through those um, nodes, that electrical node, the metal at the end, um, you add different elements. So red is neon's natural state. So that's why a lot of signs, like that Martin's Hardware sign is a red sign. The Jesus Save sign was a red neon sign. Um, Barbecue King is red, but it also has blue to it. So to add different, or to get different colors, you add different elements. So like um, carbon dioxide is, uh, results in white. Mercury results in blue. Helium results in yellow. Um, it's a chemistry experiment every time you put it together. Well, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I did not realize that that's how they did that. Huh. Well, listen, I wanted to, uh, I, I think we're, we're running low on time now, and, and I really uh, appreciate your, your coming and, and speaking to us today. I, I think it was a fascinating conversation. Uh, and uh, let me pass it back to Warren now, who Thank you. Uh, I, I think is going to take us out. and. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for listening. And I really look forward to doing more of these Lunch and Learns. Uh, Chris, thank you for the great work you're doing. 
and I'm sure, uh, you know, the Charlotte Museum of History and you will stay in touch and uh, work together in the future. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Thank you for hosting. Um, this has been a great conversation about something that means so much to the museum, this idea of preservation, this idea of Charlotte's history, and frankly, the, the idea of fun and visuals and kind of these memories that we all have that tie us to Charlotte history. So I can't thank you guys enough for joining us. I've put down in the Zoom chat a link to tell us what you think about our Lunch and Learn programs. We're getting ready to launch our programs for the spring of 2021, and we really want to hear what you want to learn next. Um, some of the most fun programs we've had have been suggested by our viewers. So it's a very, very short survey. Just let us know a little bit about what you're thinking. Uh, we do also hope that everyone will continue to stay involved with the museum. We appreciate the fact that you have all quite literally invited us into your homes over the last eight or nine months here. Um, we have a couple of different things coming up. This Saturday is our next afternoon on the grounds. Uh, the museum is open for one Saturday each month, the historic home site, and we'll have the historic buildings open for you to take a look at there. Uh, we also have next Saturday, that is December 12th, our Historic Mapping Congress. You can register for that on our website. And we have a couple of things in case you are looking for a unique Charlotte history Christmas gift. Of course, we encourage you to buy Christopher Long's book for your holiday celebrations for anyone that's difficult to shop for. I mean, what, what better can you do? I put the link in the Zoom uh, to the Charlotte Science Project's website. It's available right there. Uh, we also suggest that maybe you purchase a ticket to the Mad About Modern Home tour. Um, that is available on our website as well as the virtual tour of the uh, historic 1774 Rock House here at the museum. So I hope that you all have a wonderful and safe and healthy December here. Continue to stay involved with us and we hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.